So the title of my talk is Joseph Riboli Revisited, and indeed it was 20 years ago, hard to believe, that I was working with Joe on the 1998 retrospective book and exhibition at the Long Island Museum. So as an art historian up to that point, my research and my publication had been on long departed 19th and early 20th century American artists. And I thought, oh good, you know, I've got an artist now with Joe that I can ask questions to directly and I'll get the answers. So it's going to be a lot easier than what I was used to is doing research in archives. Now some artists will volunteer everything about their art, what their influences were, why they painted what they painted or created what they created, what they had for breakfast, you know, you get the, you just get the whole story, um, all that good stuff that you need, but not Joe. <laughs> <laughs> He was a most reticent subject. And as we talked, bits and pieces would emerge. And then suddenly he'd stand up and he'd say, I've got to go paint. And out the door he'd go. So we only had like, I don't know, I, I guess a, a kind of fit in between his painting schedule, which was pretty extensive. But it dawned on me that Joe wasn't into really revisiting the work that he had done, the work from his past. Instead, he was focused on what he was working on then and now and ideas for pictures to come. During our conversations, a few nuggets took shape. The image on the screen is the artist's easel painted in 1994. It's among Joe's best pictures and one that is very much a self-portrait reflecting his inspiration at the time, the tools of his craft, and his identity as an artist. In 1955, at age 10, Joe recognized his own natural talent for art, and importantly, his parents encouraged him. He took high school art classes, but basically taught himself during those formative years, and he learned by copying from art books. Oranges was painted when Joe was 16 years old, and we only have a black and white image of the picture, but it really doesn't matter because the painting is all about the young artist's commitment to mastering form, line, volume, and perspective. Joe was experimenting with a palette knife to apply the paint, and that's a very difficult technique to master. Color and subject were of secondary importance. You'll notice next to the artist's signature, down on the <laughs> lower right, that Joe dated, and dated this painting. Later on, he stopped dating his work, which became a real challenge when I was trying to chart the progression of his career for the exhibit in the book. Tracking down Joe's work also proved to be a challenge. He participated in street fairs, he exhibited in galleries in Westchester County, Connecticut, New Jersey. On Long Island, he exhibited at Gallery North, of course, Gallery East and East Hampton, galleries in Huntington, Locust Valley, and other locations. He also had shows in Washington, D.C., North Carolina, New York City, Block Island, Boston, Chicago, and California. His work disappeared into homes and into private collections, or corporate collections. In 1964, Joe was accepted to the Paris School of Art in Hamden, Connecticut, outside of New Haven. To understand why he chose Pear, we need to look at his interests and the broader context of art in the 1950s and 60s. During the late 50s and early 60s, abstract expressionism was the dominant movement in American art. Jackson Pollock, Willem de Kooning, these were the trendsetters. Students and teachers wanted to participate in what was considered to be the cutting edge. In contrast, the Pear School offered a classical training that emphasized mastery of composition, technique, and realism. Joe's mentor at Pear was Ken Davies. There was an exhibit here recently of his work. Ken was a graduate of the Yale University School of Art, and he was the dean at Pear. A work by Ken is on the screen. The picture is about light, line, and pattern. You can see the connection to Davies in Joe's picture, Spring House Hill, from 1987. Among Joe's strengths as an artist was his ability to capture 
the magical effects of light, what it reveals, conceals, and how it transforms natural and man-made surfaces. In addition to his studies at Pear, Joe looked at works on exhibit at the Yale University Art Gallery and visited museums in the city. He honed in on the artists who interested him, including Willem de Kooning, whose work is on the screen. De Kooning was an abstract expressionist, um, and Joe admired his work, telling me, de Kooning can draw and compose. Andrew Wyeth was another reference for Joe. Wyeth was a very well-known artist who painted realistic subjects. There was a steady comparison of Joe's early work with Wyeth. Joe certainly was aware of Wyeth's work and accepted the comparisons. However, as he started to find his mature style, Joe moved away from Wyeth-like subject matter. <coughs> One example from early in Joe's career that resembles Wyeth is Miller's Monument. A critic at Newsday wrote that Joe's work contained what he called a Yankee nostalgia. This work was painted two years before America's bicentennial, and imagery and experiences from the nation's past were already in demand. Joe uses symbols that speak to early New England. Yet, like his still life of the oranges, George, Joe's interest was in the compositional elements, the large circles and the texture of the grist mills, the rectangles of the windows, and the patterns created by light on the weathered shingles. During the mid-1950s, Jasper Johns created a new approach to American subject matter with his mix of abstraction and realism. Johns introduced visual, a visual vocabulary that featured numbers, flags, targets, and other symbols. He came to be associated with pop art. Joe was a great admirer of Jasper Johns, and we will see his influence. Salvador Dali is probably the most famous surrealist artist. Surrealism took recognizable objects and used them in new interpretations and contexts. Here we see Dolly's melting clocks in a barren landscape. In 1966, while Joe was in art school, a major exhibition of 250 works by Dolly was on view in the city. The exhibit was Dolly's surreal subject matter and it created a sensation. Joe never fully subscribed to the surrealistic, surrealistic philosophy, yet, as we will see, he injected surrealistic elements into his pictures. What we will learn tonight is that part of Joe's story as an artist is that he was inspired by references that sparked his interest in creativity. He began looking at art books as a child. At art school, he was exposed to the ideas and the work of his teachers and fellow students. He visited art museums, and he lived a life in a society filled with visual images such as movies and advertising. From that ever-developing bank of visual and intellectual awareness, Joe independently accepted or rejected ideas. He pursued his own vision and developed his own style. Upon graduation from art school in 1967, Joe joined the military and was stationed in Virginia. He was assigned to the Army Exhibit Unit, staffed by military and civilian artists whose job was to present ideas and then make art for traveling public relations efforts. During that time, he kept painting. In 1969, Joe secured an exhibition at the M Street Gallery in Georgetown, Washington. And that same year, he was released from the service. He also began exhibiting at Gallery North. Joe settled in Stony Brook for about five years and did contract work at that time for national magazines in the city. Joe was clear that he did not want a career as an illustrator. He was totally in it for the money. And to keep his mind active and his eye fresh, 
He painted and he continued to study the work of artists he respected. On the screen is Joe's summer number from 1970. The circular form frames the prominent number five. Why number five, I asked Joe. Joe said it was his favorite number and that he used it to represent himself. He liked the mix of curved and straight lines, which are also seen on the wooden structure. We will see his continued attraction to objects with curved and straight lines in other works. When I first talked with Joe about Summer Number, he told me it was just a channel marker. I responded, okay, Joe, but one of the most famous paintings in American art is, I saw the figure five in gold, and which was painted in 1928 by American artist Charles de Muth, and that's in the Metropolitan Museum of Art. I saw the figure five in gold is rendered in a cubist style with forms that have symbolism and pronounced geometry. Joe was clearly aware of this picture, and yet, as we talked, it became clear I hadn't quite hit the mark. Well, Joe, how about Robert Indiana <laughs> and his series of the number five painted during the 1960s? I could tell I was getting closer, but according to Joe, the real influence for Summer Number was Jasper Johns, who in addition to the American flags that we saw before, he also painted a series of bullseye targets. And Joe's Summer Number was not a channel marker, it was an invented subject. This painting by Joe is called In Use from 1974. He told me it was a painting of a sluice gate. But it too has a frame, famous reference. Take a moment to look at the wood structure and how it's composed. And then let's compare it to Vincent van Gogh's Bridget Arles from 1888. Winslow Homer is among the great 19th century American artists. And on the screen, we see Homer's 1869 painting titled Long Branch, New Jersey. The focal point are the two women with the parasols. We see them perched on the edge of a sand cliff bracing against the ocean breeze. Now let's take a look at Joe's Cussawag Beach from 1987. Perched on the sand cliff in, this, cliff in this picture are a pair of beach umbrellas and chairs positioned at an angle. I showed the homer to Joe and he just smiled. <laughs> Red Truck from 1974 is a surreal subject. This symbol of the American past is buried up to its front grill in sand. Like all good surrealist pictures, it raises questions. You have to wonder if Joe saw <laughs> the groundbreaking, I'd be interested how many of you recognize this scene from the movie, okay. Have to, it was the groundbreaking science fiction classic, The Planet of the Apes, released in 1968. And the movie's iconic shot, the one that everybody talked about, is that of the Statue of Liberty buried in the sand. In 1974, Joe met George Schechtman, who owned Christopher Gallery on Madison Avenue. George saw Joe's work and included it in a group show the following year. Two years later, Joe had his first solo exhibition at George's gallery and would continue to exhibit in Manhattan for 14 years. Joe's beach at Greenport was painted the year of that first solo exhibit. Through his exhibits in the city, Joe built a reputation among collectors of American realism. From the earliest exhibits onward, Joe's work attracted notices from critics in major national art magazines. Oftentimes, the critics commented on what they called the artist's solitary contemplation. And if that's what his work was about, it was an important thing to address in the book. But as we look at Joe's work, you know, are we really seeing solitary contemplation? Joe said no. 
He said, a mood of contemplation, much less anything solitary, was never his intent. Instead, he explained that his goal was to achieve a creative connection between artist and his subject. However, he understood that people took away their own points of view in response to his pictures. And it's been noted that Joe rarely included people in his paintings. I had to ask Joe that question too. His response, he associated people with illustration work, the work that he did for hire in the city following his military service and could not wait to leave behind. People in the picture completely change the dynamic. When a figure appears, it becomes the focus of the picture and the figure implies a narrative or a story about that person. Joe simply did not find storytelling interesting in his art or for his art. He was aware that what he brought what he called order to his compositions. The subjects in this pictures are not exact transcriptions of what he was seeing at any point in time. They're not photographic type records. He observed, he invented, he mixed, he edited, and he composed. If there's a story to be taken away from Joe's work, it's the discovery of form, line, and light. In 1982, George Schechtman relocated his gallery from Madison Avenue to Soho, and he renamed it Gallery Hennick. The village environment of older buildings full of texture inspired a series of pictures where Joe explored urban subjects. Joe's Greenwich Village Light from 1985 is a study in, in white and gray. The picture is tightly framed with architectural verticals and horizontals. Raking light creates its own geometric patterns. The viewer is suspended between the first and the second floor. In this picture, Joe said that he was putting together elements that were not quite comfortable. An American master of the urban scene was Edward Hopper, whose early Sunday morning from 1930 is on the screen. It's a bold picture with dominant colors of red and green. Here too, raking light defines the architectural facade. Joe entered into a period where he explored the colors of red and green and light. This is Prince Street Garden from 1990. It's a very large canvas, and on it we see masses of the color red overlaid with strong verticals, horizontals, and diagonals in green. And then he added the complex patterns of light and shadow. It's an amazing picture. Now showing from 1991 continues the theme of red and green. The canvas could almost be split in half between the two colors. Prominent in the picture are the curved and linear forms of the letters, rendered with great care and repeated in front and on the sides of the marquee. Court Light, also from 1991, is from a series of red and green tennis court paintings. The pattern of the net and, the, and its shadow on the court is an outstanding achievement. We're looking at a painting by Franz Klein that was painted in 1956. Joe was a fan of Franz Klein's work because he appreciated the simplicity of his black and white canvases, his bold expressive line, and the use of, use of white as a color field, and the forms that are suggested through the contrasts between black and white. Klein painted in large formats. This work is 80 by 100 inches, and it envelops the viewer when the picture is seen. This is a beach scene by Joe, painted in 1983. Look at the fence and how it moves into the distance. Joe is experimenting with the fence as a complex vertical and its complex vertical and diagonal lines, which dramatically move through space. This too is a large canvas, 50 by 66 inches. Exhibiting a work of this size was easily accommodated at Gallery Hennick in the city, 
which had tall and spacious walls, so Joe was able to paint and exhibit larger canvases. Joe's sophisticated use of line and form is apparent in the picture Block Island Games from 1987. Our eyes move through the canvas due to Joe's mastery of line and geometry. The opposing triangles on the rectangular shuffleboard, the strong horizontal of the laid stone fence, and the horizon that spans the picture from end to end. The numbers on the shuffleboard allude and harken back to pop art. The Adirondack chairs, like Joe's favorite number five, have a mix of straight and curved lines, as do the silhouettes of the stone posts. In the 1990s, Joe painted a series of pool pictures, which are seen drained of water or full of snow. If there is a picture that reminds me of Franz Klein and his elemental line, this is it. Just squint your eyes a bit, which is something that art historians do all the time, because it helps the details to slightly blur. Look at the blue wedge of the pool and the dark, thick line that runs on the left from the bottom to nearly the top of the picture. And instead of the Franz Klein white, we have a softly blue tinted snow, which creates an abstracted color field throughout the picture. I spoke earlier about how Joe edited his images or changed their context to create something new. This photo is of old abandoned gas pumps on Montauk Highway. Joe took that imagery and transposed it onto a desolate beach. Again we see that surreal touch. The beach was a preferred setting for Joe throughout his career. I believe it was because the neutral tones provided a color field similar to Franz Klein's white. Here we see the surreal context of the pool set on a beach. When I first saw the pool pictures, I asked Joe if he had seen the movie The Swimmer. Released in 1968, The Swimmer is a story about a Madison Avenue advertising executive who lives in, affluent, in an affluent Connecticut suburb. One day he realizes that he can swim from one backyard pool to the next, meeting his neighbors along the way. He then encounters an empty pool. Joe most definitely saw the movie, and he said that the shot of that one empty pool stayed with him. Joe's series of rock towers from the 1990s also have surreal touches. The stacked rocks defy the laws of balance and gravity. They're arranged to meet the artist's interests in forms and in the variety of the curvilinear line that they create. They have a monumental presence made even more dramatic by their silhouettes against the sky. Indeed, the rock pictures have a very primitive quality which I compared with the majestic carved figures of Easter Island. The comparison between the stacked rock pictures and Easter Island was not something I asked Joe directly about, probably because he had to go out and paint, but I wrote about it in the book, and he did not disagree. In conclusion, I believe that Joe fully understood that as an artist, he was part of something larger than himself a continuum of creative expression that spans the centuries. To tap into that energy and transform it into a unique vision is what sets an artist apart. I have to say I'm very glad that Lois asked me to do this talk because after nearly two decades, it gave me the opportunity to revisit facets of Joe's work and to make some new discoveries. It also reaffirmed my admiration for Joe's remarkable talents. Thank you.